My name is Dr. Rich McLean, and I've now proven a conspiracy to pervert the course of justice at the Australian government. The problem is that I have been unnecessarily victimised. That victimisation is malicious, and it means to cause me harm, and my problem's systemic, and it's political. I'm in a very difficult situation of um, being homeless. I haven't got enough food. I haven't got medicine. Um, I can't get a lawyer. I'm a failed whistleblower. And I can't report crime to police, let alone systemic corruption. It's a very difficult time. And I'm speaking from the heart tonight in order to try and change it. I'm a gay guy, and um, I also suffer from a mental illness. I've been diagnosed with schizophrenia, adjustment disorder, ADHD, and now I have a cognitive brain impairment, the result of a suicide attempt inside Werribee Mercy Hospital in 2021. There's been an outrageous whitewashing of that tragedy, and um, a settlement was never reached. And the very organisations and people that actually caused me to suicide, because it wasn't mental illness, are now the same people who are covering it up and whitewashing it. Um, I had a former partner, Steve Isonides, and he was a very clever man. He worked for the Australian Secret Service, ASIO. Um, now, I've tried to get a settlement from him from the time he um, exploited me over five years and then left me homeless with his dying dog. Um, and up to this point in time, no government department anywhere in Australia will admit that that relationship even existed despite enormous evidence to the contrary. And that's called corruption. And it goes right up to the Office of Prime Minister and Cabinet who refuse my freedom of information, when at first they said it was voluminous and complex. It would be. I'm a human rights awarded autobiographer and artist. I wrote a book on my experience with schizophrenia and it was awarded Sane Australia's Book of the Year and it was awarded a human rights award. I was also an illustrator at the age and the Herald Sun here in Melbourne. Apart from that, I have was granted a merit-based scholarship and I studied a doctorate. I'm a doctor of philosophy. And when you study a doctor of philosophy, ethics means to do no harm. But great harm has been intended for me, great harm has become me, and then great harm has elongated um, and continued to harm me for a long time. <coughs> now, um, the Office of Prime Minister and Cabinet are clearly, um, they're just wrong um, in that the freedom, the documents don't exist, they're saying about my freedom of information. That's incorrect. If I've got a former partner who's an ASIO agent, I would be on the government radar. If I worked in the media, I'd be on the public radar. In actual fact, I've spoken in Australian Parliament itself. So I would be on the government radar. As well as that, um, I've been an exhibiting artist for 30 years and I've exhibited all over the country and, in, and in, internationally. And I've also had a documentary made on my life and work by the Dax Collection. Um, apart from all that, um, I've been a fearless independent advocate for over 30 years, sticking up for people with mental illnesses and sticking up for their carers. Um, and I've done that independently and I've spoken on local, state, federal and international levels all over the country. And I've also spoken on the Today Show, I've been on ABC Radio, I've been on SBS's Drug Debate, I've appeared in many, many 
different places in Australian TV and media. For the Office of Prime Minister and Cabinet to refuse my freedom of information when at first citing it was voluminous and complex and then later on down the line just said no documents exist. That's an absolute fallacy. And I've actually just recently written to um, um, the Attorney General and also to Prime Minister Albanese and I've detailed um, the abuse and the victimisation which has happened to me over time and my homelessness as well and the fact I don't have medical care and the fact that I can't get a lawyer, I'm a rejected whistleblower and I can't go to police. Now they got back to me and Anthony Albanese referred me to the Attorney General Mark Dreyfus. Mark Dreyfus's department has never acknowledged me and they referred me inside the, inside the office um, to go and seek answers at ASIS, who are the body that investigate ASIO, and also the Commonwealth Ombudsman. Now, ASIS have already acknowledged um, my former partner and has refused to investigate how corrupt he was, how he exploited me, and other illegal activities. And now, um, I've also received a, a, a negative response to my public interest disclosure at the Commonwealth Ombudsman, and they have um, denied any further correspondence from me. So that's the big kahunas. The Ombudsman, the Attorney General, the Prime Minister, ASIO, I can't get a police, I can't get a lawyer, I'm a rejected whistleblower. And I might say that I'm rejected as a whistleblower because most places have said that I'm not a public official. Well, that's incorrect. There are four ways I could be a public official for the purposes of the PID Act. And that is, I was a former partner, a spouse, engaged to be married for five years with an employee of ASIO. That makes me part of the family, but I've been excommunicated. Now, the other reason is because I worked in a public hospital as a nurse type role, and that classifies you as a public official. The other one is that I, um, PIDs are allowed by people who have got a government contract, and I have a contract, or I did have a contract, with the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission. And the last way, that I'm a public um, official is that in my rejected PID to the Federal Circuit Court of Australia, the Federal Circuit Court actually acknowledged my evidence and they said they're satisfied that I, that I am or I was an employee of the Department of Social Security because I had a contract with the NDIS and I worked for them. I had a government login and I had um, receipts and I got paid for COVID money, they're satisfied that I was employed by the Department of Social Security. That means that also I'm a public official. Now there's something happening right now which is really interesting. My public interest disclosure at the Department of Social Security got acknowledged and then they rejected me on account of I wasn't a public official. <coughs> And then I took all that evidence to them and they've acknowledged they've received the evidence. And now it's up to Paula Stratton of the public interest disclosure at the Department of Social Security to do something about it. And I'm willing to compromise and I'm willing to cut a deal with the government so that I can have a home. It's not much. I don't ask for much and I've never got by with a lot of money. All I'm asking for in this society as a person with enormous merit and who's achieved a lot and has given his life serving others independently out of altruism for this country is that I want this public interest disclosure to get up and I want to make a compromise if you don't want to investigate all of it and I want to have a home. I need a home. I've got a dog and I deserve a home. 
the Charter of Human Rights of a Person with a Disability that was ratified by the government in 2008 state that a person with a disability, such as me, should be um, provided reasonable accommodation. Now, you would think the NDIS are the place for that. And although I've got enough money in my NDIS plan, the money is all locked up at the NDIA and I can't access it and they refuse to release it. So the government has literally witnessed me numerous times suffer and fight and fight all these agencies and literally watch me become a vagrant. It's not fair. It victimizes me. It's oppression and it abuses my human rights. Now, Tash, my NDIS worker, actually documented my human rights abuses after um, working with me for about three months and noticing how rejected I was, how ostracized, how ghastly, how no one acknowledges me, how my point doesn't get across to lawyers, to police, to public officials and to government agencies. Now, that is a legitimate human rights abuse that's been documented by a government worker. However, it wasn't signed off by any of the companies Free Living Australia or personalised support services who were my NDIS providers. And I took it to the Australian Human Rights Commission and the Australian Human Rights Commission refused to investigate it. I'm also banned, banned at AFCA, the Australian Financial Complaints Authority. That's a place where Australians can go to get their financial detriments actually legged and heard by an ombudsman and decided on an outcome. Now, due to their own policy, they've got six weeks to get a marginalised person and actually take them through the process and arrive at a conclusion. Now, my cases took over a year and a half, nearly two years. And Tim Goss, head of service delivery at AFCA, is a person who's in on it. He delayed, denied, deferred my determinations. And he did it with a conceited amount of audacity in which really distressed me. And um, they just elongated it and elongated it. The government mantra with anything is delay, deny, defer. That is the language with which the government speaks to me. And um, now I'm banned there. Now I've got a clean criminal record. Um, I'm not perfect, but I've got a clean criminal record and I'm a democratic citizen of this country. It's not okay that a democratic freestanding citizen of the country with enormous merit and who's worked so hard for the country get oppressed and neglected systemically and politically by people like Tim Goss and the Attorney General who refuses to investigate the Australian Human Rights Commission and AFCA. I might say too that um, I've lost my work cover case. That was heard um, by WorkSafe, got shifted to Comcare because it was, a, it was the NDIS and Comcare rejected it on account of me not being, you guessed it, a public official. However, um, it was appeal, uh, I appealed it and it went to the AAT, but that was a decision that was not fair. It was not impartial. It didn't have preconceived notions about it. It was predetermined to fail against me. And this is how I know why. Because um, Kate Watson, the government lawyer for the government, she absolutely knew about the Charter of Human Rights of a person with a disability, which says a person with a disability must have equality before the law and must have access before the law. And I told the Ombudsman and I told the Attorney General, I said, I don't want this AAT case to go ahead because I can't get a lawyer. I've tried. Now, I've been psychometrically profiled by the Australian government. And as soon as my name, my date of birth or my phone number comes up on the government screens, a big 
bell goes off and there's a notice, do not help this man. It's unreasonable that I'm 50 years old, I have spent 50 years on this planet and I've had lots of legal issues and I've never once had an authentic, unbiased lawyer to take me through to the other side. Now that decision of the AAT lost me a potential 700 and something thousand dollars. And that was um, absolutely predetermined and it was destined to fail. And I'll tell you how I know also why I know that. Because when I went through um, the Australian Human Rights Commission and AFCA abuse, um, I actually wrote to the then Attorney General, Michaelia Cash, and I reported systemic corruption. And I said, this is under your banner. The AAT is another statutory agency under the Attorney General, and I'm going to lose my work cover case. And I sent that in 2022. And she got back to me and she said, she can't intervene in personal issues. And if I have any problems, then I should go to Lifeline. And that's exactly how the world treats me. They vilify me for mental illness. I've been systemically and politically robbed over a long time and I've got no money. I've had no home. I don't even have health care. I've just left hospital after being incarcerated as a political prisoner and the mental health team won't even take me on as a client. Now, this corruption goes um, right to the top and it started from small beginnings um, years ago. I was opposed by an extremely powerful lawyer, Russell Ball, who is the head of Ball and & Partners. And I had some unfortunate evidence, but evidence all the same, of a malpractice case. It wasn't taken out of extortion or malicious in any way. It was because I have to check things are real for me because I've got such a wide margin of error with my thinking due to the schizophrenia. So I had this recording and <coughs> Dr. Uh, Mr. Russell Ball managed to silence that recording and also a transcript of that recording at the Health Complaints Commissioner, the Mental Health Complaints Commissioner, the police, IBAC, APRA, NHPOPC, the Victorian Inspectorate and the Ombudsman. And he is a man who informs government policy and advises the Ombudsman. Now I'm a failed whistleblower at the Ombudsman and the case is still live. The recording's out there. What happens now? This has been a little another conspiracy to pervert the course of justice with powerful key political stakeholders um, actioning extreme influence and political privilege and managing things to silence things. And in this way, um, decisions such as the one at the AAT with the bare facts that I was a public official, well, who knows facts when you've got power on your hands, you know? I'm a legitimate person. I have a good heart. I mean well, and I think I've done a good job. Um, these public officials, they don't have a conscience. They're paid by the government to tow the political line. And unfortunately for me, that means that every public official has victimised me, ostracised me, oppressed me, and acted with a malicious intent in order to redact my prosperity, to brutalise my human rights, and to cause me harm. Um, I just want to say that that harm was actually caused, um, like I said, in February 2021, when I actually killed myself from the systemic and malicious oppression and the conspiracy to pervert the course of justice, which was already going, which I didn't realise until after I'd survived the suicide attempt, when I got a freedom of information from the Health Complaints Commissioner, which tabled exactly who Russell Ball was, and he also um, works with WorkCover in APRA as well. Um, so it's a bit of a big story, but look, um, it goes right up to the top. The Office of Prime Minister and Cabinet are in it. They refused my freedom of information. And um, the letter that I wrote to him, which details um, the corruption at, um, at ASIO and the corruption at the Ombudsman, and the fact that no politician ever, ever will acknowledge that 
me and Steve Isonides had a legitimate relationship. And that relationship and the evidence of it is already produced and it's already published. It's on my website, imustbecrazy.com.au, a facetious title that aims to um, try and take back a bit of my power instead of being vilified as mad or intentionally have my prosperity redacted from me over and over again and again without a lawyer, without being a whistleblower, without going to police and suffering financially from a systemic and politicised lens. And then when I get distressed, when I have no home, when I have no food, when I have no medicine, when I have no support, I crack the shits. And you know what they do? They vilify me with mental illness. My poverty is intentionally designed by the federal government. And my illness, even though I've got an underlying vulnerability, is designed and that harm is heaped on top of me again and again. And it's done by attacking me financially and taking my rights and by removing all access to the law. The Charter of Human Rights of a Person with a Disability states that we must have equality before the law and access towards the law. And that is the law that underpins all laws in this country. Hi there, it's Dr. Rich McLean. I'm a scapegoat of the Australian government and a refugee of the Australian government in my own country. And I'm a free citizen, apparently, in this democracy with a clean criminal record. I oppose this victimization as I always have, and I will win. But if this does kill me, if this systemic, prolonged political persecution actually killed me again, then this video would stand testament and exist on the internet and it would be have to investigate it. It would be have to be investigated by the coroner. And due to that, um, if I died, my story would be heard and the people who have been so cruel to me, the public officials, the lawyers, um, the government agents and the politicians would all be held accountable. And I'm a powerful person and I've got a big heart and people really are jealous of me and they want to kill me. And that's a fact. I know it because I killed myself out of the systemic prolonged um, financial reduction of my finances and scapegoating and conspiracies. I actually killed myself and it was deemed fatal and I was revived by something that wasn't me. I was found accidentally with no pulse and um, I was revived from certain death. The Freedom of Information says that that tragedy was deemed fatal. And I can only say I was saved by the hand of God and I'm here for a purpose and I'm here for a reason and I matter and I'm important and I'm the authentic one here, not those public officials, lawyers, politicians and other powerful people who are part of the structure of the socio-political landscape who tow the party line and remove themselves from all liability from my harm. I'm important. I've won. I'm still winning. I win just by being alive. Next week, I will have no home and I want a home and I deserve one. The Charter of Human Rights of a person with a disability says that, um, that Australia ratified in 2008 says we must be provided with suitable accommodation. And that is the law that underpins all laws in this country. I won't rest until I have a home and my basic needs are met. Currently, I'm a failed whistleblower. I've never in my 50 years been able to get a lawyer and I can't go to police to report even being drugged and raped. Um, 
This is a profound injustice. The problem's systemic and it's political. And it literally is a conspiracy to pervert the course of justice, which is intentionally and maliciously trying to cause me so much harm by consistently redacting my prosperity, eroding my rights, taking my liberties and damaging me. It's already damaged me. I won't let it damage me anymore, at least as long as I've got sentience. My name is Richard McLean. The date is the 26th of September, 2023, and this is to the members of the United Nations Human Rights Council. I'm submitting this to the Committee on the Rights of Persons with a Disability, CRPD, for the declaration that was ratified in Australia on 17th of July, 2008. I, Richard McLean, am the complainant and the victim, and I've written this statement and I've provided all the evidence on my website, www.imustbecrazy.com.au. The interim and provisional measures may be adopted in urgent cases to request that the state in question adopt measures to pre prevent irreparable harm to the alleged victim while the case is still pending consideration by the committee. Irreparable harm means a harm which, due to its nature, cannot be sus susceptible to reparation. I'm requesting interim measures and I I'm going to demonstrate that the risk is real and I've published it all on imustbecrazy.com.au and you'll hear me speak about it in this video. I'm applying for the interim measures because I am being harmed in an irreparable way from which I will never recover and I may never recover. I'm without medicine. I'm homeless. I can't survive on a disability pension alone. The research shows it's impossible. I have threats to kill both me and my dog from my former partner, Stefan Isonides, former ASIO employee. And no government agency, whether that be Centrelink, the tax office, the office of prime minister and cabinet, the attorney general, many politicians and all lawyers will even admit that my former partner and I were ever together and we were together from 2010 to 2015 and we were engaged to be married. Um, this means that the coercive financial control and family violence, which he imposes on me from refusing to settle in a legal, fair and equitable way, is elongated and emboldened by the Australian government. My human rights are being abused in that I am victimised, I am oppressed, my finances have been maliciously and intentionally, systemically, politically redacted from me until I've had nothing and bankrupt with no home. I have had no legal help in my 50 years as a human being on this planet and I cannot go to police and I am also a rejected whistleblower. The risk is real and you're going to hear about it tonight. This is my story. The subject is urgent requests for investigation into human rights abuses and threats to health, welfare and safety of me, Dr. Rich McLean, alias Baron Dodger. I, Dr. Richard McLean, am writing and speaking to you today to urgently seek your intervention and investigation into the severe documented human rights abuses and threats to my health, my welfare and safety that I'm currently facing as an Australian citizen with a clean criminal record. My complaint pertains to a violation by a state party, specifically the Australian government, which has failed to fulfil its obligations under various international charters and agreements, mainly the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, CRPD. It also extends to the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman or Degrading Treatment or Punishment, CAT, and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, ICCPR. Um, but it will be submitted under the Disabilities one. Here's my introduction. My name's Dr. Richard McLean, alias Baron Dodger. I'm a former artist, 
of the Herald Sun and the Age, an advocate, an author and autobiographer of a book called Recovered Not Cured, A Journey Through Schizophrenia, published by Alan and Unwin, and I'm an academic, but now I'm a government scapegoat. I was diagnosed with schizophrenia when I was 20, and I wrote that Human Rights Awarded Autobiography on my experience with schizophrenia, and it was awarded St. Australia's Book of the Year, as well as a Human Rights Award. When it was published, I was humiliated and vilified by the Herald Sun newspaper, my former place of work. And um, only weeks later, um, I was unfairly dismissed from my job at the Age newspaper. With that publication, I became well known, especially because of my tireless advocacy for people affected by mental illness and their carers. I was unaware in hindsight that I was being exploited. I appeared in local, state, national, and even international audiences, in person, on TV, and radio. A documentary was made on my life and art by the Dax Collection, and I'm now 50. I have been diagnosed with schizophrenia, with ADHD, adjustment disorder, bipolar, panic disorder, and now I suffer from an acquired brain injury, a cognitive brain impairment that was the result of a suicide attempt. The tragedy of the suicide attempt, um, the causation of it, was not mental illness. It was out of protest and the result of being framed, being vilified for mental illness, being victimised unnecessarily, and for having my prosperity politically and systemically, maliciously, intentionally, intentionally redacted from me, in, including losing my legal rights and my access to legal rights in the law. I suspected I was in a conspiracy after I was released from the hospital. A freedom of information proved I was right. Evidence in a malpractice case was systemically silenced by government advisor and lawyer, Russell Ball, and the transcript of that evidence was also silenced. I live in fear because I'm a scapegoat and also fear litigation for having recordings of different people and situations or an even more direct political retribution, such as being charged and jailed, being framed with a crime I've been set up in, or incarceration in a mental health institution, again, as a political prisoner, in order to silence this statement. <coughs> I record things because of the wide margin of error in my perceptions, and I need to really check it. That's called reality checking, and it's a thing I do, and it's a thing I've always done, to check the veracity of my perceptions. An unfortunate recording, not taken out of malice nor for extortion, of a GP's malpractice, Dr Whitaker, was silenced by a powerful lawyer, Russell Ball. He informs government policy and advises the Ombudsman, where I'm a failed whistleblower, and they refuse all future correspondence. The evidence was silenced at the Health Complaints Commissioner, the Mental Health Complaints Commissioner, the Police, IBAC, the Victorian Inspectorate, APRA, NHP, OPC, and the Ombudsman. At the same time, I was seeking redress from other sources. My childhood sexualisation by my neighbour, Bob Martin, and various other people um, was one. The Geelong Victims of Crime tr Tribunal magistrate cited me as, quote-unquote, doomed to fail in her um, result. And I realised years later that's because I'd been framed as an extortionist for having acquired the recording and was apparently chasing money, which is absolutely incorrect. Or at least that's what I thought. I also wanted redress from a former partner, Steve Isonides, 11 12 71, that I was engaged to for five years from 2010 to 2015. I'd been in a living, same-sex relationship with him, and in hindsight, he exploited me. I was living off a total permanent disability payout from my health super fund after I became stressed in my role at Northwest Area Mental Health Service that was paid by my super fund. He was working as a consultant first at Apple under Steve Jobs and then under David Irvine at ASIO with the Australian Secret Service. I reluctantly lived off a disability support pension when I should have declared the relationship legally, 
but he was earning upwards of $30,000, $40,000 a month. After I was exploited over five years and my money gone, he left me homeless without a fair, equal, legible settlement and leaving me with his dying dog to look after to boot. He was a sociopath. He was occasionally violent. He was greedy, menacingly intelligent, another child sexual abuse survivor and incredibly controlling. He preached monogamy, but in the end, I found he was doing the opposite, putting my life and health at risk. Um, And this was just another methodology he utilized in order to control me as um, the way he was entrapping me by encouraging my independence to encourage um, my pension, my, the receipt of my pension. And so um, I exhausted my nest egg whilst with him. When I was finishing my PhD, I began to try and reclaim some of the million dollars in super, the shares, the house he sold. Um, um, and he sold a home under my directions for over a million dollars. It was unverified that he told me he put it in an offshore tax haven. He admitted to being present at murders in Alice Springs and Collingwood Town Flats, and his dog was named after Chopper Reed, an infamous villain whom he knew from when he dealt drugs because Steve used to be a cocaine dealer. The settlement never came and my community lawyer abandoned the case. In 2010, he had drugged me and violently sexually assaulted me Although we preserved forgiving, uh, I persevered forgiving him at the time. I've not been able to report that to police even recently for fear of them actioning the Mental Health Act and incarcerating me as they have done numerous times before in a psychiatric institution. ASIO's boss, David Irvine, was consciously aware that I was being exploited because I found out he tried that, that Steve tried to make a carer's pension claim for me which would exclude us being a couple, but my parents still received it because I used to live with them and they still cared for me and it was red flagged and I was and I was alerted my parents um, still received it. So he found out. So from ACO down, no government agency has ever validated the relationship ever existed. That includes the Prime Minister's office, the Prime Minister, the Office of Prime Minister and Cabinet, the AAT, Mark Dreyfus, the Australian Human Rights Commission, ASIO, AGIS, who investigate ASIO, um, but they refuse to investigate it, and the Ombudsman. He is enacting family violence upon me by coercive financial control, and the government has his back. Systemically and politically, the government, by not acknowledging the relationship, have elongated my financial abuse and emboldened my poverty silenced a well-known fact, backed up by evidence, um, which ended up forcing my bankruptcy in 2021. At one stage, Footscray Police, who knew we had been together with him um, and whose name would um, flag a protection, um, consciously knew I was being systemically and politically robbed and that it was affecting my mental health. Rather than acknowledge the whole picture, um, they threatened me with the Mental Health Act and literally forced my dog and I into the car and away from my home, which by that stage was a squat because I couldn't afford to pay any rent. On one occasion, I was hiding in a hostel and I received a message via a gay dating app that had been um, that he'd been caught for embezzlement of a million dollars and that he wants to kill me and my husky and he wants the husky dead. To legitimise the message, the police need to tell me if the embezzlement happened, but it makes sense because of his corrupt investments and the new ABN made at the end of our relationship. This was a direct threat to kill me and my dog. He had already exploited me and made me homeless, threatened me, and somehow not one friend acknowledged the relationship or sided with me um, since the breakup. He was and is enacting threats to kill and coercive financial control and the police and the government are on his side. Now that I literally cannot report being drugged and raped by him to police for reasons of police incarcerating me, if I show up at a station and the police, I am sorry, 
If I show up at a station and the police are aware who he is and what he did, I have to conclude this man's... Oh, that doesn't make sense. Sorry, just bear with me. Um, Steve is the reason of my financial persecution and is one of the original genesis points of my detriment. It's no surprise, just before I was incarcerated the first time in a psychiatric ward, Werribee Mercy Hospital, that I had attempted to gain a settlement with his superannuation and I have evidence of his malice threatening to report me to the NDIA if I did not come up with the evidence about the murders that I threatened to blow the whistle on and about the, um, the money that he stashed away in an offshore tax haven. The Prime Minister recently refused to acknowledge the relationship, instead referring me to Mark Dreyfus, the Attorney General, and his office, and again referred, referred me to AGIS, who, um, who investigate ASIO, and who already knew about it, and the Ombudsman. And they had already rejected my public interest disclosure, and it stated they refused all further correspondence. The key issue of that conciliation seemed to have blacked out every other issue I had in a systemic and politicised way. I'd been seemingly, seemingly consciously, maliciously and intentionally redacted any prosperity that was coming to me over years. The things that I did have um, to make me money were taken from me, such as the destruction of my website, www.richmclean.com.au. And that name, that web name, was also my ABN. And that was maliciously and intentionally destroyed by government-linked web hosting company, Micron21. Um, and, and the cancel of my contract with the NDIS Quality Safeguards Commission, the continued rejection from any or all lawyers being banned at AFCA, causing over a million dollars in detriment, and the Australian Human Rights Commission refusing to investigate my documented human rights abuses, victimisation and oppression. Additionally, my workers' compensation insurance was shepherded by WorkSafe to Comcare, and there Paul Fowler re rejected it on account of not an employee for the purposes of the SRC Act. Paul Fowler was the old boss at um, WorkSafe, and Russell Ball worked with WorkSafe. I, appeared, um, I appealed Comcare's decision and it went to the AAT, but in this time I had attempted suicide in the meantime in a hospital and had been revived from certain death by being found by accident unresponsive with no observable pulse. I had refused to go through to the AAT hearing because I knew it was imbalanced and not fair because the government had a high profile lawyer, Kate Watson, and I had no lawyer, lawyer and I wanted one. I begged the Ombudsman to stop it, but they didn't, and I asked the Attorney General to stop it, but his office said he would not intervene. I claimed it went against my human rights as a disabled person for being locked out of the law systemically and utterly when every government department I'd ever corresponded with had access to a whole legal team. Looking back, none of my decisions, going back years, at institutions, organisations, or state or federal government agencies were ever fair, unbiased, not corrupt, already not predetermined, and they were also illegal. <coughs> Previously, I had written to Michaelia Cash, the former Attorney General, about my issues with the Australian Human Rights Commission and AFCA, and I rightly predicted that due to this, my Comcare has failed and so would the AAT. She didn't, intervene, she didn't intervene as she sent me to Lifeline. I was exposing systemic corruption, but it fell on deaf ears. I was not surprised when Member Pennell was favourable to Kate Watson's defence of the government to not pay my work cover. I appealed at the AAT, saying that the decision was unfair and illegal because a disabled person is supposed to have access to the law and equality before it. However, they still upheld it and the decision, looking back, was clearly premeditated and corrupt. Going back another financial detriment, I'd also, when I got unwell from work in February 2021, claimed on my HCF life income, income assist from HCF. They had refused it, saying my illness was pre-existing, despite concrete evidence from Dr. Richard Moore that the term schizophrenia was never an issue when I went to visit my GP and it was just for sexual health checkups. 
The discharge summary, summary from that first hospitalisation said I was neither delusional nor psychotic, so schizophrenia was not the issue. I fought it for a long time, and now they've got a staff member um, to put an AVO on me, who I've never heard their name and I've never met them, and if I do so much as call HCF, then I could be arrested. It's a desperate way to try and silence me and cover their tracks of the conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. There is now a cover-up of the suicide attempt tragedy uh, at the Werribee Mercy Hospital when they owed me a duty of care. This is a new layer added to my detriment already in a systemic and political way, up to and including the Ombudsman who won't investigate it. Redress has never occurred for the brain detriment that I now have. Saltwater Clinic, the community mental health facility that at first um, um, disregarded me due to an impasse, but then re-engaged me um, uh, after a year and they force medicated me for ingrained delusions of persecution which were in fact real events that were consciously aware of that way of force injecting me with antipsychotic medication on and off for years caused me to hallucinate and caused me distress that treatment was experimental it was immoral it was unethical because they consciously knew that my delusions were real and it was malpractice Dr. David Horgan prescribed me my dexamphetamine script in about 2016, I think it was. I performed remarkably well on that medication. I did a master's degree, a PhD, I worked, I fundraised for the Royal Children's Hospital, I wrote and illustrated a children's book, I worked helping marginalised students, and I created my own business and I ran my own business for two years before I came unwell with the conspiracy and being triggered by my own sexual abuse stories. Now, that medication after my first hospitalisation got removed from me. And that's a terrible way to treat someone when it's been proven again and again, and over, over history, that that is the medication that I need, and that I've got a diagnosis for. And it's a real tragedy that that medication is not provided to me so I can act in an optimal way. That's malpractice. Right now, I'm officially homeless, and in one week, I have to remove myself from this house, and they're going to force remove me and my dog, and we've got nowhere to go. This is an absolute emergency, and this needs to be acknowledged by all the people that I send this to um, as an emergency. It's an emergency disclosure, not only for the violent threats, but for the reduction of my prosperity, the lack of medical care, and for the fact that I'm not even going to have a home. It's not enough that I can't be a whistleblower, that I can't get a lawyer, that I can't go to police, that I've got no food, that I've got no medicine, that I don't have enough money, that I don't have a home. Um, this is absolutely an emergency disclosure and I would like all of the agencies to consider all the evidence I've said in the conspiracy to pervert the course of justice and all of the evidence that I've spoken about today is provided on the website imustbecrazy.com.au. I've been rejected mental health care, even though I've just um, left a psychiatric hospital, and I've neither a psychologist nor psychiatrist, would you believe, and I'm in very temporary accommodation till the end of the week. Um, I've been robbed systemically and politically, and I've been set up to fail. This is what it is. It's a conspiracy to pervert the course of justice that victimises me and has and is occurring and it goes right up to the Prime Minister's office. It's underpinned by key, powerful political stakeholders. Steve Isonides, who worked for ASIO and who has the government's blessing, and Russell Ball, a lawyer who informs government policy and advises the Ombudsman. And that's where I'm a failed whistleblower and they have refused all correspondence. That means 
I'm blocked out of any help, anywhere, anytime. I've been thrown to the trash heap and I'm being discarded as if I'm not even a human being. Like I said, I'm a failed whistleblower, despite evidence to the contrary that I am actually a public official for the purposes of the PRD Act. I can't go to police to report crimes that have happened to me, including being drugged and raped and being violently beaten up and being fiddled with as a kid and literally being gang stalked and ran out of town by police threatening the Mental Health Act to the exclusion of all other things in my life and that I've never ever in my 50 years had legal help. This is a marked victimization on my person and it's not fair. Now, I'd just like to say that I've diligently pursued domestic remedies to address these violations, engaging with numerous government agencies, departments and authorities, including the highest levels of government, such as the Prime Minister himself. Despite these extensive efforts over years, a satisfactory solution has not been found for this impasse. The exhaustive list of agencies and authorities I've interacted with demonstrates the comprehensive pursuit of domestic remedies, in my case, to no avail. Every time I engage someone, the decision to act in a way which delegitimizes my voice or my claims, or make choices to redact my prosperity, or remove my legal rights, has already been made, and answers are predetermined in order to suit the malicious and corrupt plan to harm me by redacting my prosperity. That harm that is wished on me, the harm that forced my suicide attempt but I was revived from a certain death, is the same harm that is still happening to me today. And it's putting a vulnerable person with no money, no rights, no access before the law, no food, um, not enough medicine, no home. It's really pushing me to the limit. I'm a suicide risk. I am not suicidal, but one would be forgiven if you are prone to suicide by giving it all up and throwing it all in. Um, the same system that persecuted me into oblivion has now exonerated itself from any liability for the malice they'd all intended for me. Three years later, and I've lived in poverty as a scapegoat with barely a home, food or medicine. No single public official was going to admit liability for what was essentially a murder. And they would rather sacrifice and kill me now and then blame mental illness before any acknowledgement of the sort. So there's a huge standoff happening right now of government public officials, healthcare workers, psychologists, lawyers, politicians, and they all back for the same team. And they all vilify me for madness um, to the exclusion of every single other factor in my life. My poverty over my life has been intelligently designed as the evidence will show and the underlying vulnerability of a mental illness that they heap the pressure on and amplify until such time as I have no home and no money and no food and no rights. And they're all watching me from afar like cowards and they're rooting for my demise and they're all consciously aid and abet my death. Because you know what? If I killed myself today, right this day today, drugs and mental illness would be blamed. They would exonerate themselves from all responsibility. And my poverty is neither the result of a character flaw and it's neither the result of any weakness on my behalf. In actual fact, I have superhuman resilience for having dealt with this abhorrent amount of oppression and victimization. And um, this is a consciously designed poverty for me. And um, you can't take someone's money away until they've got nothing in distress and then blame mental illness. That's a really silly way to treat someone. And it's very obvious when you spell it out the way it is. And you know who else wouldn't be blamed for my mental illness, but for my um, suicide if it happened tonight, but should be. 
It would be Steve Isonides. It would be Russell Ball. And it would be conceited and privileged public officials such as Tim Goss from AFCA, Liz Lisberg from the Australian Human Rights Commission, um, the Prime Minister, the Attorney General Mark Dreyfus, um, the, the NDIS Minister Bill Shorten, um, Government Lawyer Kate Watson, Senior Member Pennell of the AAT, David Irvine of ASIO, Gabriel Williams, the Mental Health Minister, my former doctor, David Horgan, who refuses to give me my dexamphetamine script, it's malpractice, not John Whitaker, who gave a suicidal man a fatal dose of opioids when he explicitly said he was going to kill himself, and not the CEO of HGF, Sheena Jack, and not every single Australian politician, because I've actually emailed all of them regarding this issue, and I was absolutely, categorically, systemically, ghastly, not acknowledged and rejected. I'm an infamous vagrant, and it's not okay that this continuing persecution happened to me, and that I literally have no home, as well as all the other detriments and the incredible threats to my wealth, my my wealth, my health, and my welfare. It needs to be investigated. I deserve a home. That's what the Charter of Human Rights of a person with a disability actually says. <clears throat> At a little while ago, a few years ago, I was hearing voices in accusationary tones in my room, screaming, you're not schizophrenic and rapist and pedo and faggot. And these noises were inside my home. This is a way that I've been gang stalked. Another um, day I had to convince a criminal who had broken into my garage and into my home to leave the house. And other people had been gang stalking my home as well. Um, I'd actually recorded the Secret Service. I, I assume it was the Secret Service. It's the government outside in a government um, uniform inside a car and they're surveilling my house. I filmed them. These are literally government agents and I'm under investigation. I've lost my freedom. I've lost my privacy. I've lost my civil and political rights to enjoy life. And they were watching and all of the authorities were watching. This was an intentional deconstruction of my finances and my life. And it was elongated and it was over years. At one point, I had casual sex with someone high up investigating the NDIS. And I also recorded it because he mentioned he might have killed people for my safety. What was revealed was a man high up in government who was very intelligent, a returned SAS soldier, and he detailed how the government would sacrifice me. That's right, they would terminate me. They'd kill me. They'd persecute me to make it so hard that I'd kill myself and let me kill myself. And they would do that before admitting liability of the intentional malice of many public officials that's happening in clear view. My situation for Dr. Richard McLean on the 26th of September, 2023, with one week to go until I'm of no fixed address, has reached a critical juncture. And I consider it, um, if it was a PID, an emergency disclosure. This is due to the imminent threats to my life, my well-being, and my safety. I've experienced severe human rights violations, surveillance, and threats to my safety. Furthermore, I've exhausted all avenues for address within the Australian government. My multiple PIDs at different agencies have been systemically rejected on account of I'm not a public official or I didn't submit it to the right person, despite the fact that I've provided ample evidence that I was a public official. And even when referred to higher authorities, such as the Attorney General's Office and ACES, that the response has been inadequate. The Commonwealth Ombudsman has also unanimously rejected my public interest disclosures and they've refused all future correspondence. I'm blocked out. This is a conspiracy. I'm a well-known infamous vagrant and I've um, been typecast as the mad person when in fact I'm the misunderstood person and I'm the vocal person and I'm the authentic person and I'm the real person. All these public officials, 
hide behind facades. They act by proxy from afar in a cowardly way to attack me. And they often do it in a silent manner, which doesn't even identify them. I'm the one with the YouTube video. I'm the one who's speaking from the heart and you can sense my authenticity when I'm reading um, from what I've written. I'm the real deal. The Charter of Human Rights of a Person with a Disability um, that Australia has ratified in 2008 says I must be provided reasonable accommodation and although there is enough to pay for it in my NDIS plan, the money is locked up at the NDIA and it has not been allocated. And this is just another way that my prosperity is being redacted from me and the malicious way it's causing me harm. The Office of Prime Minister and Cabinet at first said my freedom of information was voluminous and complex, but now say in clear defiance and with poorly veiled deception that no documents exist. This is not only highly unlikely, it's impossible. My former partner Stephen Isonides worked for ASIO, the Australian Secret Service. In hindsight, he exploited me when he left me homeless and robbed me. And the boss of then ASIO, David Irvine, can find, um, confirmed the exploit, condoned the exploitation because I knew I reluctantly accepted a disability pension when my partner was on $40,000 a month. He had me a fair, equal, legal settlement, but this never happened. In fact, no government agency has ever or will ever admit that the relationship occurred. I'm not making it up. I'm a real person. I was in that relationship. That relationship existed. The evidence is on um, I must be crazy.com.au. There is no possible way the government cannot acknowledge this fact of life. Now, he drugged and raped me. I can't report this po to police for fear they'll incarcerate me under the Mental Health Act. I've lost insurances, business insurance, life insurance, work cover insurance, income assist insurance, malpractice settlements, settlements with my former partner. Settlements with the hospital. I've lost a conciliation at the Australian Human Rights Commission. My VOCAT case regarding child sexual abuse was chucked out. My other VOCAT case where I was hospitalised with broken bones and lacerations in a violent affray in which I helped a member of the public um, was, was rejected. And my institutional child sexual abuse redress at DSS is still rejected. And they know that um, I'm going to be homeless, but they're still choosing to delay, deny, defer the payment. Um, the things that I did have in my life are gone. My business, my accreditation to work, my business website, richmclean.com.au, my home. All the things I owned in my home were taken to the tip. My beautiful art is gone. My photos of my gorgeous friends and my nana are gone. My documents are gone. My reputation has been ruined. And as collateral damage for being a scapegoat, my family don't really even talk to me. And most of my friends are gone. So the gravity of my situation and the complete breakdown of domestic remedies underscore the urgent need for international intervention to protect my rights, safety and well-being. I kindly request the United Nations Human Rights Council to launch an immediate investigation into the human rights abuses I have suffered, ensuring a comprehensive review of all aspects of my case, including the conspiracy to pervert the course of justice, threats to my life, surveillance, and the complicity of government agencies and officials. I am currently facing dire circumstances as I am officially classified as homeless, and as of next week, I will have nowhere to exist. I'm struggling to make the most basic of needs. I haven't got access to essential medication, including prescriptions that have been crucial to my well-being in the past. It's just all beyond my reach. Moreover, I'm unable to report criminal activity to the police, including instances of systemic corruption due to the complex t challenges I'm grappling with. Throughout my 50 years, I've never had the opportunity to benefit from the guidance of an impartial an unbiased lawyer. My attempts to make a public interest disclosure to various agencies have all ended in rejection despite my eligibility and my legitimate reasons for seeking to make such a disclosure. 
These profound and in interconnected issues emphasise the urgency of my situation and the critical need for comprehensive in intervention to protect my rights, my safety, my freedom from violence, my freedom from having my prosperity further taken and my well-being. My former partner, Steve Isonides, um, didn't provide a settlement um, and it's not simply possible that every single government agency and that every politician will refuse to admit that that relationship existed. I just don't understand how that can humanly be possible because it is a fact of life. I've provided the evidence as I've provided all the evidence for everything I've said on this, on this talk at www.imustbecrazy.com.au. The evidence is there. I need someone to action this. I haven't got access to the law. All these government agencies and PID people, they have a panel of lawyers. They have that, um, that resource. I'm just me, I'm just by myself. I'm totally isolated in the world. I barely have friends, my family doesn't help. I spend all my days opposing this vile victimization of me and this oppression which has literally caused my death and then um, acted to cover up that death and then further is still creating immeasurable harm to me in a way that places a, a potentially suicide, su suicidal person at great risk while exonerating themselves, all these public officials from any wrongdoing. Um, I want to emphasize this, that my poverty is not a reflection of my character weakness or personal weakness. It's a consequence of a deliberate and politically motivated systemic process. To add to my difficulties, my former partner was implicated in a multi-million dollar embezzlement scheme exposed by me. And now he has res resorted to threatening to kill me and my dog. Um, rather than take responsibility for his own corrupt finances. This level of coercion and intimidation constitutes family violence, and it's completely unacceptable, especially when it includes threats of harm. I find myself trapped in coercive financial control by him, who seems to enjoy support from the entire government and does. Authorities refuse to acknowledge our relationship's existence or investigate allegations of corruption and other unethical behaviour, even though my former partner holds, holds a pu public office position at ASIO and I was his former partner. ASIO have family values, we have gay rights in this country, and that is a legitimate relationship, and I am literally an extension of ASIO and that community. I deserve to be able to make my PID. I'm urging in the UN to intervene in my situation and address these severe human rights abuses. It's crucial to ensure that I'm protected from further harm, both from my former partner and the government agencies that have neglected their duty to safeguard my wellbeing and rights. I must emphasise the critical breakdown in the Australian government's ability to address my human rights abuses. I'm a 50-year-old individual with disabilities and diagnosis, including schizophrenia, ADHD, adjustment disorder, cognitive brain impairment, and I've never had legal representation. I find myself unable to report grave offences, including being drugged and raped, let alone systemic corruption. <coughs> Excuse me. Even in cases where my public interest disclosures were, reject were rejected, there was one instance from the federal court that acknowledged an imminent threat to my immediate harm and welfare. Given the severity of my situation, I implore the United Nations to immediately acknowledge and intervene in my human rights abuses to ensure my safety, protection and justice. I have been a victim of a conspiracy to pervert the course of justice, resulting in prolonged oppression and victimisation, and victimisation is against the law. This systemic campaign against me has already driven me to attempt suicide nearly three years ago. The malicious reduction of my prosperity and the callous disregard for my well-being by various agencies, including the police, politicians, public officials and lawyers, have further exacerbated my suffering. The threats to my life 
and not to be taken lightly. I've been subjected to death threats and I'm under surveillance by government agencies for which I possess substantial evidence. These threats and surveillance have left me in a state of constant fear and insecurity. What adds an alarming layer of significance to this case is the involvement of high-ranking officials and agencies on both federal and state levels within Australia. Among those ensnared in this matter are the Prime Minister, the Attorney General's Office, and a multitude of statutory agencies, including ASIO, AGIS, Comcare, the AAT, the Australian Human Rights Commission, AFCA, and many others. The implications of these allegations are profoundly troubling and raise serious concerns about the integrity of Australia's government and the commitment to uprighting human rights. My situation is characterised by a series of egregious injustices and systemic failures that have left me in an exceptionally vulnerable position. Despite my entitlement, my income assists... Oh, I've already said that. Sorry. I want to emphasise this, that my poverty is not a reflection of my character or personal weakness. It's not a character flaw either. It's a consequence of deliberately and politically motivated systemic process. Um, yeah. Now, um, it's a consequence of yeah, deliberately motivated systemic process. To add to my difficulties right now, my former partner has been implicated in a multi-million dollar embezzlement. Um, he's done for embezzlement. Um, that was exposed uh, apparently due to my whistleblowing and it was communicated to me over a carriage device over my phone. And now he's res resorted to threatening not only my life, but also the life of me and my dog. This level of um, coercion and intimidation constitutes family violence and it's completely unacceptable, especially when it includes threats of harm and I can't report it and the government has his back. I'm trapped. Now, um, I'm trapped in a coercive financial control by my former partner and he's got support from the government. Authorities refuse to acknowledge our relationship's existence or investigate allegations of corruption and unethical behaviour, even though my former partner did work for ASIO. And in actual fact, um, I should be eligible for a PID because he was my family. Australia um, has signed up to gay rights. That is the family. That's the new family unit, what we were. What we were. ASIO upholds, upholds family values, and that includes partners. I'm absolutely able to make a public interest disclosure because of my former partner. So I'm urging the UN to intervene in my situation and address these severe human rights abuses. It's crucial to ensure that I'm protected from further harm, both from my former partner and the government agencies that have neglected their duty to safeguard my wellbeing and rights. What adds an alarming layer of significance to this case is the involvement of high-ranking officials and agencies on both federal and state levels within Australia. Amongst these are snared in this matter are the Prime Minister of Australia, the Office of Prime Minister and Cabinet, the Attorney General's Office, Mark Dreyfus, and a multitude of statutory agencies including ASIO, AGIS, Comcare, the AAT, Australian Human Rights Commission, AFCA, 
and many others. The implications of these allegations are profoundly troubling and raise serious concerns about the integrity of Australia's government and its commitment to upholding, upholding human rights. NDIS worker at the moment, Tash, has signed off and created a document documenting my victimisation, my human rights abuses, my oppression, the fact that I can't go to the police, that I can't get a lawyer, that my whistleblower rejections keep getting rejected. And he's submitted this as a document that documents my human rights abuses. And it's never been signed off by a Personalised Services Australia or by Free Living Australia, the two companies, the NDIS companies I was with, and the Australian Human Rights Commission refuses to acknowledge the document and won't investigate these documented human rights abuses. And that is a systemic failure. That is literally the government abusing, neglecting, and negating my voice. And it's silencing me, and it's causing me harm. My website was destroyed by Micron 21, a government-backed agency. That was my business. That was my ABN. That was the architecture of how I operated my life and my digital identity. And they maliciously and consciously destroyed it. And it was covered up with the telecommunications industry ombudsman at business.gov.au and the small business and family enterprise ombudsman and the ombudsman. And um, they got away with literally des destroying my whole business that I worked for 20 years on with impunity. I wish to say on another incarceration, I was violently beaten up by an underworld, not so underworld, um, government thug. I was violently attacked inside the hospital and my nose broken and my hand broken in the violent affray. And I know that it was um, set up to be that way, that I would be attacked inside the hospital because I've got a very particular tattoo on my arm. And this man had that tattoo on the design of his t-shirt, which was an extraordinary coincidence that's not even possible. Now, um, he was in there and um, I noted and I acknowledged the tattoo and that was a message to me that um, we see you in there and we can do what we want and we can do it with impunity and we can attack you, we can infiltrate any way we want. And he came up and attacked me and I had to defend myself and um, I ended up breaking his nose, I think, but um, that was in self-defense. But, um, but I've been violently attacked inside a hospital and thugs set up um, to attack me. That's not okay for an Australian government agency to do that to a person. And um, furthermore, I'd like to say that um, when the police um, got the Mental Health Act and they literally um, used that to the exclusion of all other factors in my life and literally ran my poor dog and I out of town in the car like a, um, like a, a fugitive, an innocent criminal, they chased me out of town and I had to hide in hostels. Now, I think they were following me, and this is what makes me sure. When I was in the hospital hiding from the police, trying to escape the hospital, the very place I'd already died in, and the place that then covered it up, um, I went out to walk the dog um, to take her for a walk, and a car careered out of nowhere, and it ran me down in the street. Now, I was mowed down by the car, and I believe that was a shot across the bow from the Secret Service or the um, underworld agencies. And they were letting me know um, that we can do this. We can destroy you and we can do it with impunity. And they did it in such a way that I was on the run from the police. And so I couldn't call the police when the car stopped. I'd, I'd fallen over, I'd hurt my leg, the dog was hurt and um, I lost my glasses. And I couldn't call the police and I couldn't stay there. So I had to just pick myself up after they mowed me down in the street. And I had to go back to my hostel, broken and bruised and feeling very sorry for myself. This is a vile way in which they've victimized me and which, with which they've um, actually um, maliciously mowed me down in the street. I can't say enough about it. It's, it's brutal violence. This is what the Australian government has done to me. And it's done it in such a way that's isolated me and character resuscitated me and it's um, removed my family and friends and um, it's blamed me for mental illness and escaped liability for all the public officials and police and everyone else and it's isolated me and that's what it's done for me. 
I've had to be very brave and I've had to be very authentic and I've had to stick true to who I am because I've only got this, this and this house. Apart from this house in a week, I've got nothing. I've got no rights, no access to the law. I've got no food, barely money. This is not okay. This is a victimization that's profound and everyone's aware of it. I've written thousands of emails to government agencies and I'm now infamous in the government. There's not a, probably a public official out there who doesn't know who I am and then I'm an infamous vagrant and sure enough, they think I'm crazy. Maybe I am, but I'm also a human being and I'm also a person with a disability and I've got a good heart and I deserve not to be treated like this. You know what, when I was released from hospital the first time in 2021, um, Michael Legrasso, the psychiatrist there, in his discharge summary from the hospital, from the suicide attempt, made a significant assessment. He noted that I was neither psychotic nor delusional and instead diagnosed me with something new, adjustment disorder. This diagnosis serves to validate the real and legitimate late nature of the abuse I've endured and it underscores that my experiences were not delusional, but rather a response to the very real challenges I've faced. Dr. Legrasso's diagnosis underscores the importance of recognizing the veracity of my claims and the urgent need for intervention and justice in my case. I kindly request that the organizations I've um, tagged in this post um, and the United Nations Human Rights Council launch an immediate investigation into the human rights abuses I've suffered. This investigation should encompass all aspects of my case, including the conspiracy to pervert the course of justice, threats to my life, surveillance, and the complicity of government agencies and officials. Time is of the essence in this matter, as my life is in immediate danger. Your intervention can make a significant difference in ensuring my safety, securing justice, and upholding the fundamental principles of human rights. I eagerly await your prompt response and action on this matter. The international community looks to the United Nations Human Rights Council to protect the rights and well-being of individuals like me who face grave injustices. Every day I wake up and assess my homelessness and poverty and every day lived like this is another day that family violence and coercive financial control has won and further, that is elongated and emboldened by the federal government and politicians who won't admit the truth. Every day I endure more financial destruction, never having access to the law or equality before the law to gain my various redresses, compensations, insurances or settlements is another day that my human rights as a person with a disability has been smashed by a convention Australia has ratified yet never followed through on. In hindsight and proven with evidence is the fact that my decisions and determinations that have been decided by government departments have never been fair or impartial and looking back have been predetermined outcomes corrupted by people like powerful lawyer Russell Ball. My evidence demonstrates he silenced the legitimate evidence and even the transcript of that evidence at many agencies up to and including the Ombudsman of who he advises and also where I've rejected PID disclosure. Every day I wake up and I'm not safe from this persecution and the death threats to my dog and I, um, who had admitted to me he's been present at other murders. I don't feel safe, I don't feel secure because I've filmed investigators um, at my old Footscray squat surveilling my home and I can't be sure that I'm not being followed or harassed. Every day, my civil liberties have been eroded and it cannot be expected that with this type of systemic and political persecution and the malicious redaction of all my prosperity, that it is possible to enjoy any freedom or leisure time, especially with no money and saturated with worry for where I can have a place to simply exist with a roof over my head. Every day, I mourn the loss of my family and friends who by and large have all witnessed me coming undone, but either didn't want to or couldn't intervene in a meaningful way. I feel anger for people because they have rejected me and because I've been begging for help for a long time. They all know I've been struggling and many are in positions of privilege and money with houses, jobs and cars, and still just 
they just ignore they don't just ignore me they willfully pointedly neglect me and for this I struggle to settle in me and find peace because I know too that they maliciously mean me harm I want to live and I want to enjoy the sun and the plants and the people and my beloved dog crystal many people would not believe it but I actually love all people and forgive all my oppressors but that does not negate being paid or compensated in a way that would still not cause them physical harm in the way they've collectively acted to harm me. In conclusion, the compelling evidence I've shared in this letter and also posted on um, www.imustbecrazy.com.au underscores the urgent need for attention and immediate action from the United Nations Human Rights Council. My journey has been marked by severe human rights abuses, systemic neglect, and constant threats to my life and well-being, and I cannot burden this alone anymore. The systemic failures within the Australian government, the involvement of high-ranking officials and agencies, the denial of my essential medication, the exploitation and victimisation by my former partner, and the consistent rejection of my public interest disclosures all point to a grave injustice that demands international intervention. I respectfully call upon the United Nations Human Rights Council to launch an immediate and thorough investigation into the human rights abuses I've endured. The evidence I've presented here, along with the urgency of the situation, leaves no room for hesitation. Acknowledging my plea and initiating an investigation is not only a moral, moral imperative, but it's a legal duty to protect human rights and uphold justice. And I wish finally to express my deepest gratitude for considering my plea and taking the time to read this letter and listen to this video. I eagerly anticipate an immediate acknowledgement of the pressing nature of my case and further confirmation of the investigation. To do otherwise would, in essence, be aiding and abetting a disaster that threatens my life and my well-being and the rights that you would think a person has <laughs> that I should hold dear. I do hold rights dear. <sighs> I'm a sucker for justice. I really am. And I'm really hoping that you can help me in my situation. What I really need, the basics, is um, access to the law, equality before the law. I need a home to live in. I need enough food. I need enough prosperity. I need the leisure time with something to do and I need to engage again with the NDIA and work back in the community. And I deserve my detriments to be paid and I deserve to expose, at least in a little way or even a way that's a compromise, this conspiracy to pervert the course of justice because I'm a person who's had enormous merit and I've worked my entire life. I'm not incapable. I'm a doctor of philosophy. And... Um, even though I've got the detriments now, I still have the vernacular and I still have the intelligence, just the memory's not there. And I really do um, think that there's a way forward where everyone can win. And I promise you this, when I win, everyone will win. That's my speech. Thank you. <laughs>